Good morning, sorry. Good morning and welcome to episode 65 of Talking to Artists. So this morning I am really excited to talk to uh, Denise Buseman Hilgar, who goes by The Artist Abroad and you will totally understand why that's an amazing moniker uh, given the fact that her work is really inspired by her travels, having to say goodbye and having to come back. Uh, a couple of just very quick things. Really want to uh, remind everybody if you're in Toronto, Riverdale Art Walk is happening this weekend live. Um, it will also be online for about two weeks, but the more important and fun thing is the fact that it's actually live with 75 artists in Jimmy Simpson Park. So I will be there with some of my new work because of course I haven't had a place to show it in the last two years. So um, hopefully you can kind of come out and, uh, and check out the show. And the other thing is I'm sure you've been starting to hear me talk about my family garden, the uh, group show, I'm, well, solo show I'm doing with my sister, Helen Hutzel. The opening will be September 15th. I will definitely send more information, but I'm really hoping we can all get together at Leslie Grove Gallery and have a couple of drinks and enjoy the art. Anyway, I'm going to just uh, bring on Denise now and uh, look forward to chatting with her. And hopefully she will come on board. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm great. Good. I was uh, I was really interested to uh, kind of I was listening to your video and stuff, but uh, I um, I've seen your work for years, and so I've always really so been really intrigued by it. <laughs> I think so, we've uh, sort of drifted in and out of the same shows here and there. I think so. Yeah, I know. It's funny because when I was actually going through, I'm like, yeah, I'm so familiar with your work, and I feel like we've done a lot of the same shows, but I'm not sure we've actually ever sat down and had a conversation. <laughs> so this <Yeah>. is great. <laughs> Um, so obviously a multimedia artist focused on kind of memories and inspiration. And, uh, it sounds like a lot of your uh, work is obviously inspired by traveling, but more leaving the places that you're traveling to versus going to them. So maybe well, you can talk a bit about your inspiration or how that happened. Oh, well, it's a little bit of both. Um, when I, when I travel to someplace new, it's, I also use my work to sort of explore my new environment, especially when I first uh, moved to Montreal, for example, in uh, 2009, I did this whole project to sort of get to know the city. I went to every single borough on the island, took photographs and created a painting for every single borough just to sort of familiarize myself with this new city. And then lately I found that because um, I lived in Japan uh, three years and I came back last year in July. And for the f really for the first time, it has hit me. Well, this time it hits me harder than uh, than ever before. The leaving part, and I don't know if that had anything to do with the whole pandemic situation or if it was just that I was coming back to a country that I already knew, as opposed to going leaving a place and going to something completely new. Like a and new adventure. Sort exactly. Of thing. So, so yeah. right now I've, I'm feeling very strongly that my work is helping me cope with all those feelings of loss. And, and, and I guess it has always done in a way because um, I, I'm one of those people who have always really struggled with saying goodbye. Even when I was like a little girl, the first few times going to school, I was bawling my eyes out. I was literally throwing up. <laughs> from crying oh my, <laughs> my mom like all the other moms were like this kid should not go to school she is sick and my mom was like no she really isn't <laughs> <laughs> that must have been so hard for your mom though because I, I know a friend of mine was like that too and he would like hang on the screen door it's like mama don't leave me and I'm like my heart breaks <laughs> you know? I know so so it has been something that I've struggled with all my life and um I guess even when I go on vacation somewhere I always leave a place with that feeling that I've not explored enough and that I might never come back again so hmm. for me I always have this urge to take like 500,000 photographs somewhere <laughs> just to keep those memories and then I, I use those photographs and I sort of fuse those memories together and then I uh, and then those paintings sort of represent that that time that I spent there and and for me they are they are all like the, really these these very precious memories and so I wonder what why it is that you kind of it seems to me that you have this compulsion to stay where you are and not leave and not say goodbye and yet on the other hand it sounds like you've done a huge amount of traveling and lived in places that most people wouldn't have done that so it's how does true that happen? yeah well <laughs> 
it's actually something that has surprised me the most of, of anybody, I think, be because I was one of those people as a, as a child. I mean, even going to my grandmother's house for, for vacation, I would like have the crazy crying fits. And then my, my grandmother actually had to sleep in the bed with me for the first couple of nights because otherwise I'd be like a wreck. So I would also not go uh, to play dates with other kids when I was little in like, like preschool and everything. Uh, kids would come to my house, but I would no way I would go to another kid's <laughs> house to play. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you like you're like your own environment, right? So there's something yeah. about the comfort of your own environment. Exactly. So for me to to have made that step is it, something I guess really huge, and it all came about because my husband um, is an engineer, and for his work he uh, he had to move to Texas. So we we tried this whole living apart for a year, and that that was not awesome. <laughs> So no, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, no, it was not great. So eventually I, I took a trip there and I checked it out and I was like, yeah, this is actually really cool. Let's just try it out for like, I think his contract was, was for another two years. I'm like, okay, I can, I can do another two, two years. That, that sounds all right. So we, we did that. And then I never, I never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> you're addicted <laughs> a little bit it is but it's weird because when you when you move away from your home country and everybody that knows you and and like your family and everybody who knows who you are you get to reinvent yourself as a person you get to be your 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 true self as as it were um without the influences from from outside from the people who knew you as a kid so yeah i i think i think that's really actually really powerful like i you know i didn't move countries but when i was a kid my father was an engineer as well so we moved about every four years so at that point where you kind of just get established and just get settled and then you're kind of uprooted again yep. but i do remember very consciously when i went to university and it was kind of like yeah i've these people I've lived with all my, for my, you know, for the last sort of high school years, five years of high school, and they kind of have a perception of who you are, which doesn't align with who I think I am, like what my perception is. Exactly. And so I do remember very consciously thinking about what I was going to be and how I was going to project myself. And it's quite liberating <laughs> to be it able to is. do that. It is. And, and especially when I moved to Japan, because uh, being an expat and, and living as an, an engineer's wife, as, as they say, um, you you have this sort of image um, from from I don't know why, but apparently expat wives are known for just going out for lunches and and doing the shopping <laughs> and shopping for like clothes and jewelry and shoes and whatever whatever. And I'm not like that. I, I well, mean, how, how many years? How many days can you do that if you're there for three years too? <laughs> Also that. So I and, and for me, my art is my full time job. I consider this to be my business. So I am very serious about it. So I quite often, especially in, in Texas and here in Canada, I, I got people who were like, "Oh, it's so cute. You're, you're keeping yourself busy, making your artwork." So when I moved to Japan, I very um, specifically made a point to every time when I introduced myself, I would introduce myself as being a professional artist which in the beginning sort of took people aback a little bit. And it also, I think, made some people think I was a little arrogant. But in the end, it did give me an opportunity to do a multitude of shows and end my stay with a solo exhibition that I sold like half the pieces that I had there, which, which I was super proud of because it's something that I organized by myself in a country where I didn't speak the language and with a group of people that I sort of amassed over those three years that I really like networked and, and, and did all those things. So yeah, that's in a way it, by presenting myself as this professional artist, I, I feel that that was really important to just give that, uh, that image to people uh, up front. So they knew how to how to uh, how to relate to me, I guess. Yeah, and it's funny because I I do remember uh, the videos on Instagram when you had that solo show at, at the end of the year, and I remember it being like super impressed because first of all it was a beautiful show and the work was really beautiful and the venue I seem to remember was really it was as well. yeah I was so yeah. lucky it was the the lady who taught me Japanese the who my Japanese teacher 
her husband runs this gallery and this was totally random she got totally randomly assigned to me and then and the, at first i was like i'm not sure and then she I, I i checked it out and it was this beautiful like renovated traditional japanese building yeah it was so gorgeous i was, it was so, so lucky. perfect was. i know i i never think holy cow like how did you pull all that stuff together that was impressive <laughs> i know and the guy it was so funny because uh she speaks english of course because she's a teacher but he, his english is, is sort of not so great and he was a little on the fence about this whole like mixed media art because in japan this is something that they're totally not familiar with so he was like oh, we'll do it but i don't know and then when I started selling, he was like blown away. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, is the, is it Japan, Japanese art culture, like the Chinese, where you're sort of, you're trained by a master at a certain style and that's what you pretty much do for, for yeah. your art career. And they're very much about um, rehashing stuff. So, so um, Japanese people are um, in general, I mean, there's, there's, of course, there's exceptions everywhere and there's tons of really, really talented artists out there. But um, it's very much a culture where uh, they learn certain techniques and they will do certain things for decades. Or like I, I did like uh, technique classes. Of a, I learned how to make a Japanese kite of this g guy. And this was literally a thing where you had a piece of paper that was painted already. It was like printed. And then you had these six or eight bamboo little sticks that you glued in a certain way with a certain type of glue and a certain type of brush and whatever. And you folded it over and you put a string on it and that was it. And this guy, his family had been doing this for hundreds of years. Wow. You think and you might get kind of boring. Needs, yeah, and it all needs to be done just so because the, the tradition and the technique, it's all so important to them. So I think for a Japanese person to step out of that and to uh, to have an original idea, they're not really taught to have to be creative, to to have these original uh, ideas or uh, original ways of thinking. So seeing something like this, where I'm sort of fusing their culture with something that is uh, foreign to them, like techniques and materials and 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 things. That was that that really they were quite surprised by that. It was they were sort of sort of um, confused at some points where they were like, "It's Japanese, but it's not Japanese." <laughs> well, it's it's interesting too because I'm kind of guessing that a lot of their art, from what you're saying, and from just from my very small experiences with China, is so based in uh, in tradition and generational and respecting your ancestors and bringing your ancestors' techniques and ideas and concepts forward into kind of the future very which, much um, you know there's a lot of cultures that really value that which I think is incredible but it must for some people be a little bit binding in terms of not being able to sort of express your own voice for sure yeah I, I think it is and I think in, in some places in Japan it's getting a lot better like Tokyo for example is a lot more free and and, and there are really really incredible Japanese artists out there that are doing amazing things combining and, and sort of evolving those techniques and, and really doing amazing stuff with that. But if you like the general public is not really used to that. And what about the buying public then? Cause that must be kind of another interesting, are they, are they looking for something different and contemporary? Cause again, in China, I know there was a, a real interest and fascination with Western artists. And part of that I think was because the fact they weren't doing that traditional. Yeah. Um, piece Selling art in Japan is tricky, mostly because they don't have space. They have oh, very yeah. small homes, very, very little wall space. So their art in general is maybe like a three size, like 11 by 17 or something. That, that would be a size that they would collect. And then they have the hanging scrolls, which they, the, the cool thing about Japanese people and the way they collect art, because they love art and they all have, they actually have a dedicated space in the traditional Japanese home called the toko na, uh, Tokonoma, which is specifically um, created to display a scroll or artwork. And then mm -hmm. what they do is they will, uh, with every season, they will re rotate the artwork. So they, especially the scrolls, it's very easy. You roll them up and they go and there's, they're all little in their own little box and you store them away. And then when comes spring, you put something else on the wall. But they That's have very, cool. yeah, it is really cool. <laughs> but they have very few uh, pieces of art in their own homes, I find generally. 
although I did, I did actually sell to some Japanese people because there are, of course, people who have more Western style homes and larger homes. And, and uh, I've actually sold quite a few pieces to, to friends of mine who sort of bought as uh, partially as a memory to, to having me as a friend and, uh, and knowing me. Uh, and I actually sold one of uh, my uh, 30 inch by 40 inch to uh, to a Japanese lady, which was quite impressive. Initially, she wanted a scroll, which is about 12 inches wide and like 57 inches high, like long. And then she had it in her home and her husband was like, but I really, really like the other ones. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then they decided on a larger, a larger New York piece because they had lived in New York. So, and it, it's proudly hanging in there in their entryway, which is really, really nice. Oh, that's cool. So it sounds yeah. like a lot of your pieces then it's, it's almost like, you know, I mean, I personally love to, when I go travel somewhere, I love to buy a piece of art that's from that locale, just so it's a great reminder. And it's something you actually keep and look at. Um, and so when you were in, so the work that, that features, uh, Japanese iconography does that typically get sold to Japanese people or to people who visit Japan or is it a whole mixed bag? Uh, well, I sold some people, uh, some pieces, like I said, to Japanese people, but I find mostly it's it's expats who have lived in Japan or people who have traveled to Japan frequently. Um, I have this one collector; uh, she she um, does classes in Japan. She's done so since years and years, so she'll travel every every year, and she's uh, collected a few of my pieces. Uh, and uh, she's actually looking at some of the pieces I'm working in, on now because she's really excited about the new work. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, I think we might have lost Denise for a little bit, but hopefully she will pop back. And once again, I never know if it's my feed or if it's Denise's. Hello? If anybody's online, if you can just tell me if it looks like it's me or if it's Denise, that would be super helpful. Might be me. Okay, so uh, unfortunately we lost Denise for a second there, which is unfortunate because we were getting into a really great conversation. I'm going to um, see if I can bring her back on board. So let's see if I can, oh, actually she's not there yet. It's Denise, okay. <laughs> it's usually me, but I'm not at the cottage this time, so I actually have, uh, have better vision. Okay, so uh, Denise, if you're there, it looks like we lost you. So please uh, join again. And then we will kind of continue our conversation. Here you are. Yeah. That's great. Always happens. I don't know, okay. one day I'll have one without. Hey, hi, sorry. I don't know what happened there. Oh, uh, you know what? Technology is funky sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I was just, yeah, I think we were having a great conversation about kind of the, uh, who purchased the art. Do you ever yeah. get pushed back with being non-Japanese and make, and using Japanese iconography and representing Japan? I, I get that a little bit. I had that uh, at Artist Project um, when uh, last year in, in um, February, uh, where my, because uh, I, that year, it was the year I was going to go back to uh, to Canada. So I flew from Japan to, to Toronto to specifically to do the art project because I figured it's a good opportunity to sort of re-enter the art world there. And I, yeah. I, the only work I could bring was the washi paper work because I, I, I could roll that. I, I could not like bring all my wood panels on the plane. <laughs> no, I could see that. <laughs> no, so by necessity, I had a completely Japanese booth. It was just the hanging scrolls and the washi paper work and it was all Japanese. And people were sort of, some people were like, what, what's this? This is confusing. Why, why, what's your fascination with Japan? And then luckily it's, it's still said that I was from Nagoya, Japan on my like little name tag. So some people were like, oh, that makes sense. And then if I explained to people that I'd lived there for three years and they were like, oh, that totally makes sense. But yeah, yeah sometimes you do get the. <laughs> I hope we haven't lost her again. Hmm. Okay, well, this is never good for a live 
conversations is a challenge. Um, all right, I think I'm going to have to <laughs> move her again and uh, see whether or not we can. Yeah, no, I can't even remove her. All right. Sorry, guys. Um, so let's see what else I can talk about. What I was actually really looking forward to talking to Nisa about, which, uh, yeah, she's done so many other really interesting things that are kind of traditional Japanese and uh, learning those skills, which uh, I think is quite fascinating. So we will wait to see if she comes on board. I can see that I'm going to have to get Jasmine to do a lot of editing on the podcast because there's a lot of going to be chunking here. Um, all right, here she comes again. Let's try again. Oh, it's so hot here today. I'm dying. Third time lucky? Yeah, I, I moved to a different <laughs> space in the house because I think my studio some, somehow, I don't know, I have like a, a zero, I would have turned off my Wi-Fi as you suggested, but I have zero cell reception here. So right. <laughs> that would not help. And then uh, usually my Wi-Fi is okay in the, um, but I don't know, today it seems to have a bug or something. No, <laughs> so I like moved to the living room. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I'm actually in my bathroom. That's one of the best places I actually get Wi-Fi. I'm actually at, at home at least because usually I'm at the cottage and it's the same thing. That's why I'm never sure if it's me or if it's yeah. my guest that's having problems. Like so um, one of the things I was just fascinated with when I was looking at the, uh, the video that you were doing is uh, learning to do handmade paper. And it's something I have a huge affinity for as well. I did a lot of it in university and worked with an artist whose specialty was handmade paper. Um, and he was kind of hilarious. You had to be careful what you wore because he would literally look at your shirt and kind of go, I think we can cut that up and make handmade paper. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, bottom of my blue jeans were like really short. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. That is awesome. So it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I really fell in love with the Japanese paper while I was there. Um, I, I had always been working on, on, um, on wood panels uh, because of the transfer techniques that I use. It's just easier. And then I saw the paper there and there was just so many, there's this one store in Nagoya where I used to live and it's, it's all paper and they have thousands and thousands of sheets. So, and I was really, really lucky because um, north of Nagoya, about an hour and a half drive from me is Mino, which is the, basically the capital of, of washi paper in, in the world. Most mm. of, the Jap of the Japanese paper that you can buy here in Canada comes from Mino. So I could travel there and they have this big washi paper museum where they have like art that is made with washi and you can also do classes there. So it, did a whole, it was like a full day course where you can, in the morning, they just let you like mess around with it a little bit and, and sort of figure out how the, how the stuff works because you have to, um, it's, it's a, f the fi a fiber of the mulberry plant and they're very elongated fibers. And the cool thing about uh, Japanese washi paper is that it's not made with any glue. It's, um, it's just the fibers and the, the way you move the screen about that sort of weaves the, um, the fibers together in different ways. Mm. So the paper gets the strength. So you have to scoop and then you have to keep it level and you have to move it in a certain way. And then you have to scoop again and move it in a different way. And it's really, really <laughs> tricky. And it, it, it's, it, it's quite, uh, quite the process to, to learn to do that. And at the end I had created like four sheets of paper or something. Yeah, we did. Uh, I did like a whole year. It was part of my printmaking course actually. And I do remember adding hibiscus because I guess hibiscus has a natural starch. And so that was kind of used to sort of bind it together. But yeah. it was fascinating how you can make like almost transparent, translucent tissue paper to things that were really thick and toothy. Yeah. And yeah, and the cool it's, thing uh, about the Japanese fun. paper was too that they used like um, a shower head to shower the water. And then the water drops would push the paper, uh, like the fibers away. So you get these like little round drop, droplets almost, which gives a really, really cool texture. And there's so many mm -hmm. different ways they, they created cool textures with, uh, with like putting a screen on top of it so you could see that some, some of the places would not hit the water. And it's really, really uh, so many cool things. They, they mix like gold leaf in it and uh, actual yeah. flower and flowers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did that. And watermarks, you could yep. kind of create your own watermark. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And so yeah. do you still do that? Or, or was that something you just did for that, uh, uh, for that the course? The making itself, uh, not so much because you need a lot of materials for that. Uh, it's, it's really all very, again, particular and following certain traditional, traditional things. 
and like they, the fibers you need to um, they they need to be dried in the sun, bleached in the river. Uh, that's actually the reason why Mino is um, the center of washi paper is because the it has the cleanest river water. So they will in the spring, after the big rains, they will put the um, or in the fall, I think, late summer. They will put the uh, fibers that they've cut from the trees in the river, suspended in the river, and the sun and the water will bleach the fibers to where they're white. Hmm. And then they pound them by hand with these like wooden things on a stone. <laughs> and then they suspend them in these really huge bags and they, it's an extract of some roots that they put to, to sort of make the fibers loosen up. And then you can use the bamboo screens to sort of uh, scoop the the water and then there's also artists uh, in a different uh, part of uh, the same province that use the, um, the raw fibers without scooping it to actually paint so they color the fibers and they they sort of dip them and, and sort of shape shapes so you get really uh, textured highly textured uh, artworks it's really really cool hmm. Well, it sounds almost more like fiber art. It, it is almost more like fiber I art. I guess it is, really. Yeah, Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. And I, I only discovered that about maybe a, a week or two before I left because a friend of mine actually took me to see this the, uh, the studio and workplace of uh, a, a really famous washi artist. Uh, he was actually, like, the emperor collects his work and she knew him and she's like, oh, we have to go see his studio because you're almost leaving. <laughs> and then I found out that this is actually a whole new, like, technique and branch of, of art that where they paint with the washing fibers and it's so intricate and so beautiful and I, I love texture in general. So I was I, like, oh my gosh, I, I wish I'd known about it sooner because there's more <laughs> courses to do and more things to learn. I guess I'll have to go back. I know, I do want to. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna ask, do you ever, do you go back or do you kind of feel like that was sort of a, a capsule, a time capsule of what you did and where you oh, did no, and you've I done your art? To... Go back. I, I'm gonna, I only came back here uh, in Canada last year, July. So uh, going back right now, it's a little difficult, but yeah, it's definitely, uh, I, I really, really want to go back. <laughs> it also must be weird because of course you're coming back because you're in Montreal, right? Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah, so I know my daughter's in Montreal too, and it's been under pretty severe lockdown and and curfews and stuff. So yeah, so it must it be was... weird to also travel but not be able to do like what you're saying is explore the city and do this stuff because you're supposed to stay at home yeah, inside. Yeah, and it was weird in, uh, because in Japan we we never really got to that lockdown stage. We we had a state of emergency, but due to several like political things, they cannot actually uh, force businesses to close. So they can only hmm. politely request that they close. <laughs> so, <laughs> and did they close? <laughs> some of them did, some of them didn't. So it, we really never got to uh, to the point where all the restaurants were closed, where we, we could still travel within Japan and, and go to a restaurant out to eat. And we were, we ourselves were much more careful. And uh, even my show, the last show, it was sort of iffy, it was go if it was going to go. And when it went, we had to do it with uh, by appointment only. So uh, everybody could only go for like half an hour, an hour. Masks had to be worn and only two people at the time. And so so it was sort of restricted, but not as restricted as it was here. Mm -hmm. That must have been a bit of a shock. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was, it was funny because I think that was partially why uh, coming back to Canada was so difficult. Like the transition was so difficult for me this time because I had sort of I was sort of looking forward to travel back to a country where I knew the rules. And then yeah. all the rules had changed. So I was like, I was totally lost. I was like, I thought how this country, I knew how this country worked. And then I didn't. So it's almost like going to a different place. Almost, yeah. <laughs> Except you can't actually get out and take document and meet people no. and no, it's funny experience the culture. We, uh, we bought a house in St. Jerome, which is about 45 minutes north of Montreal. Yeah, and I know. My grandparents like, had a cottage just outside of St. Jerome. Everybody keeps telling me, oh, it's super nice. And we were like, <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> It looks nice. It looks nice. It looks like it would be nice if things were open. We actually yeah. went out for dinner for the first time like two weeks ago, so it does seem very nice. You know, it's so funny because my memory of of that is my grandparents lived in Montreal, so their and their cottage was just north of Saint Jerome. And I remember driving through and stopping for these donuts that had like bright pink icing, and that was like the highlight <laughs> of my trip. I don't, I don't even know what they were. They were probably horrible, but in my mind, they were like the most amazing donuts in the world. They, they probably are. <laughs> Tell me if you find them. <laughs> I 
I will. And now I have to go look for them. <laughs> <laughs> and so has, has this changed? Like, are you kind of working on a new collection that now is reflective of kind of Montreal and your move? Or are you still kind of working on the memories of uh, Japan? Or what's your thinking? I'm, I'm really still sort of uh, hooked in the whole Montreal, in the whole Japan thing. I, I am for the, uh, sort of feel the urge still to, to go back to that and to relive that and have that uh, like be a part of my world right now. And I think that's also because we haven't really had a chance to go out and, and travel and explore and, and do the things that would normally pique my interest and, and, and fuel my creativity. So right. yeah, it, it, I mean, I've, I've been at home, <laughs> so, so reliving my memories. Not really as inspiring. Right no, yeah. well, I mean, I love my studio, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's not that I can go out with my camera and, and photograph ang every angle of it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, right now it's still Japan. I have like 13, 13 new pieces in the works that I'm, uh, I'm creating right now. So, uh, and it's really exciting actually, because in Japan, my studio is really small. So I could only work up to like, I think the largest I did was 24, 48, but that was really large. And those were panels that I had brought with me from Canada because you couldn't get them that large in Japan or not easily oh. anyway. So, wow. uh, so now I can actually do like, uh, I have a 60 inch high 48 wide that I'm working on, uh, which is really, really excited. Just the fact that I can do something that I can extend my, my easel as high, you know? It's like yeah. And you can dream. step back enough to actually see it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Taking photographs of my work would be really, really tricky in Japan. I had to have these lights, but I could never get enough distance with them to get actually light the piece properly. <laughs> Yeah, that's just, it's just so fascinating. There's things that you don't even think about, you know, especially in Canada, I think you just take for granted you're going to have a lot of space. Right? Yeah. Even if you live in the city, your, your spaces are still larger than a lot of other countries. Yeah, right? I actually had, um, I had to deliver a painting because I brought all my work because we don't have, um, back, back then we were not Canadian permanent residents, we are now. So we had to bring basically our whole entire household with us. So we, we travel with everything. So all my artwork went with. And I actually sold um, a 48 by 60 inch painting to this lady from, uh, she's originally from um, Los Angeles. And it turned out that that painting did not fit in our car. Luckily, she only lived like maybe half an hour's walk. So we had to wrap <laughs> the painting up, walk it over to her house. <laughs> I hope you got pictures. <laughs> We only took pictures from when it was hanging because it was in the middle of summer. It was like 40 degrees. It was so hot. And we were just oh, yeah. really eager to get it over there. But you should have seen all the people watching. Like already <laughs> I, I was like the weird guy go in the in the neighborhood because I would also every spring log out most of my artwork to take photos of my paintings underneath the cherry, cherry blossoms. So yeah, <laughs> I was well known in the area for being weird. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you feed into that art eccentric artist. Uh, Definitely. So that's yeah. good. <laughs> that's kind of freeing too. Did that, yeah. <laughs> and so you're, you're obviously in, uh, in Montreal now or in, in Canada. So are you planning on staying for a bit or is your, are, is your brain already thinking of the next uh, artist well, abroad trip? We, we, uh, we hope to be able to travel again and, and, um, and usually we travel because of my husband's work, but right now he's working for um, a company in the San Francisco area. So uh, we don't know what the future will bring. For for now, we are, we're here, uh, but maybe we'll just uh, go, go someplace else for a couple of months and then come back here. Or if something else comes up, then we might move to China or Europe or wherever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> well, that'd be pretty cool. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like you've, uh, even though it sounds like you're kind of, you know, the goodbyes are really hard. It sounds like you've really kind of been able to appreciate and tap into the good things about kind of yeah. well, experiencing very, something completely different. Yeah, with every, uh, it doesn't get easier, but with every move, you, you do learn to get better at uh, creating your own community and uh, meeting new people and, and going out there because it's something you actively have to do. You, you actively mm -hmm. have to go out and, and make, make yourself meet other people because otherwise you, you risk being this really, really small unit in, in a foreign country and just spending time with the two of us, <laughs> which is well, nice. But. 
Well, I think it's also, it's understanding the culture of the country you're moving into, right? And I think sometimes, again, you know, being in Canada and being neighbors with the U.S. who are very openly friendly and social and bring people to their homes, um, I think that can be hard. My, my uh, parents were transferred to Switzerland um, mm -hmm. years ago for three years. Beautiful. But they said it was really hard because the Swiss typically don't invite people nope. to their homes. And they no, don't they do don't. dinner parties. And so, nope. you know, you kind of have to understand that. Yeah, I remember my, because my, my aunt and uncle uh, used to, they're in Holland now, but they lived in Florida for uh, five or six years. And then he got an offer to go to Switzerland after that. And, and she was like, no, because she had heard that it was so difficult and she's super social. And she's mm -hmm. like, it's, it, I don't, and it wasn't a really, really small town in Switzerland too. And they decided against it just because she, they had heard that it was so difficult to get any social interaction with anybody. Well, I think that's why you end up having all the expats hang out together. Like, I don't think you it's do. a, yeah. it's not an exclusion of the, of the locals, but I think sometimes it's just very difficult to kind of break into those, yeah. those kind that was of really communities, cool, right? In, in Japan, I was part of this group and um, that was 50% uh, foreigners and 50% Japanese people. It was a cultural exchange group. And lo nice. logically, all the expats would gravitate towards that. Uh, but also just foreigners that, uh, that were living in the area for, for a longer amount of time. And that really gave you the chance to not only uh, meet other foreigners in Japan, but also connect with the Japanese and learn about Japanese culture and do like go outings and events and, and things with them and learning about how they spend their days and, and the, the stuff they like to do, which was really, yeah. really cool. And I still have really good contacts from that as well. Which is well, nice. I think to your point too, though, you have to actually make the effort and you have to kind of keep, you know, pushing yourself to do that and not fall into the easy pattern of talking to somebody who speaks the same language. And yeah, and that's, of course, that's easier, right? But of course. it's it's not as, uh, I think, as satisfying at the end of the day. No, right? it isn't. No, it's, it's really nice to be able to, to um, learn about. And that's the nice thing about living in another culture, too, I find, is to really learn about a country. Because you learn a little bit about a country when you travel there, but you really, really get to know it when you live there. Because it's a very, very different experience. Because when you live there, you, you get to deal with all the not so fun things and you get to learn how to, how the day to day to day life works, like going to a dry cleaner and taking 45 minutes to explain how you want your clothes to be clean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. These are the fun things of living abroad, right? Yeah, the mundane things that actually keep the world going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so do you speak Japanese? Like, it sounds like you were taking some lessons. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I speak a little bit of Japanese. I speak enough to ask somebody where the bathroom is. But then when they start answering, I get into trouble. I find that even with French and, you know, we learned a very small amount of Turkish when we were traveling through Turkey. And it's always you have to go slowly. Like, that was the other word I learned. You have to learn yeah. really quickly. It's slowly. Because... I could speak yeah. it, but I can't understand it. <laughs> uh, well, and the d difficulty with Japanese is that um, it has a lot of different uh, politeness layers. And depending on the, the politeness level um, that they speak to you, uh, the, vo the vowels and the verbs change completely. So the words sound completely different, which oh, means wow. that I learn to speak Japanese. I can speak Japanese at the level of about a four-year-old. So I can have a very decent conversation with my, with my sensei. She, she knows the level of Japanese to speak to me. But if a stranger in a, in a gallery, for example, would approach me and they would have a conversation about the artwork, they will speak to me at a level that is like one level below the, the emperor. So I'm like, I don't know these words you're using. You speak to me like I'm four years old, please. <laughs> so did you have a translator or something in that situation? Uh, well, I had, uh, I was uh, mostly exhibiting with a, a big group of um, friends, like four other foreign artists who had been living there. Um, I was part of this artist group that was partially uh, expats, but partially people who had been living in Japan for uh, 30 or 40 years. So they spoke Japanese. So some of them would jump in. And then sometimes you'd have to make do with just hands and feet in Google Translate. And then you, you'd get somewhere. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I, the funny thing is I'm not super shy about trying. Like I'll, I'll hear a word here and there that I know. I'm like, I think I know how to answer. I think I know what you want to know. I'm, I'm going to try answer this question for you. No idea <laughs> if this is actually what they're asking, but who cares? I'm trying, right? 
but Japanese people, they want to be absolutely perfect. So they, many of them will not dare to speak English, even though they, they can, because they don't want to make the mistakes. Right. So that that's often make conversations quite difficult because I would be, be like, you know what, my Japanese is very, very limited. So if you like jump in with your very limited English, that would be great. But yeah, we could probably get way work. further. <laughs> so it's, what kind of advice would you give to artists who are kind of interested in your journey and looking to do something like that, where, you know, go to a different country and, and kind of use that as an inspiration? Just go for it. So many people think that um, moving to a different country is a big deal. And in some ways it is because you have visas and stuff to, to deal with. But in the end, it's, they're all choices that you can make. And if you really, really want it, there's a way to get there. So, so many people uh, hold themselves back by thinking that this is something that is unattainable for me. And I, I don't think that it is. I have seen so many. I have, I know this artist. He's he's from England. He lives. He's lived in, in Japan for thirty or forty years now, and he lives there as an artist. And uh, his his like permit to to stay there is based on the fact that he is an artist, and hmm. he has to make a certain amount of money and do a certain amount of shows each year. So he has to work really really hard for it. But it's also very rewarding that he has been able to live in Japan as an artist doing the thing that he loves to do just because he wanted to mm -hmm. just because he made the choice. So, yeah, I would, and I would also say it's, it's not, not easy. Just be prepared for the fact that it is not easy. It's stepping away from everything that, you know, stepping into a country where you, you don't know the rules. You don't know any people. You don't have that safety net of of uh, those people you went to art school with or your family to come to your shows. You have to do it all by yourself. So you have to force yourself, like we said, to go out there, to meet people, to to get to know the art scene. How does it work here? Uh, get Go out and try to learn the language, learn the rules, learn the, the customs. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a challenge, but it's definitely a fun one and a very, very rewarding one. So, yeah, by all means, go. Well, and I guess, I guess, of course, the other challenge, of course, would be that you're obviously such a visible minority. Like, you'd definitely yes. stand out everywhere you go, too. But um, I think that is um, – actually, I have found that living as a uh, – and in Japan, by the way, it's, it's legal. Racism is legal. So it's it, – they, they can actually oh. – <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. I'm not kidding. <laughs> that it seems like such a strange phrase. <laughs> no, no, no. But it is a thing. It, it it actually happens. I've had it happen that I I I sit on the metro and people would move away from me because I'm a foreigner and I'm like super scary, and and I I've been called things that that like experience that were not so nice because it's a thing that happens and there's a lot of uh, fear towards foreigners in Japan. It's a very very closed off country and only. I think 2% of people in Japan speak uh, another language than Japanese. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very, very, you're, you're, you're definitely a minority, but I have found that it, I think it's, it's very refreshing and very good for, for us as Westerners to, to, uh, to experience that, to experience living in a country where you, where you're definitely not, the 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 majority where you're physically and 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 like visually a minority and where they when you're when you're something sometimes you're just treated like a child because i speak at the level of a four-year-old so of course they are going to think i'm dumb and <laughs> i have to because sometimes you, i i know this happens to me too when i speak to, to somebody who is who doesn't speak english very well and i i'm sort of tempted to think that they're maybe not as intelligent as they are just because they don't know which words to use or how to create a sentence. And now I have experienced how that works and how that feels. So now when I, when my mind comes up with the, uh, these ideas, I'm, I think twice and I'm like, no, this person just doesn't know how to create a sentence because they don't speak the language as well as you do. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's very just, interesting. Yeah. That, that's kind of some of those kind of internal um, biases that you have that you're not aware of always until you go to another country. Exactly. And, 
Yeah, I found even, again, for the very short period of time, I was only in China for a couple of weeks, but, and at first it was kind of fun to be like, you know, you go places and people want to take pictures and stuff. And after a while, you just feel like, wow, I feel like people are watching and watching me see what I'm doing yeah. all the time. And that, that gets kind of exhausting, but you can really kind of have a better appreciation, I think, of yeah. um, well, you what, can what other be, people go through. You can never be anonymous on the street. That's an art of mm-hmm. Because uh, first of all, everybody's always looking at you and you kind of get used to that. But the other thing is that there's such a small amount of foreigners that you're, uh, you, you run into them all the time. And <laughs> nine out of 10 times, you'll know them or you'll know how, who they're attached to. So you always have to sort of look out what you're saying because the, pe- the people who can understand what you're saying, well, you know them probably. So <laughs> it's a very small community. Yeah. It's a very small community. So yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Hmm. Well, that's amazing. Well, yeah. we're actually almost at the end of our time. So tell us uh, what you have coming up. Uh, well, um, I actually, I'm actually part of, uh, I, I heard about it yesterday. I'm going to be part of an online exhibition uh, against um, Asian hate, which is really, really cool. Uh, this is going to be at um, SergioGomez.com. Uh, he's the curator of that show, and uh, it's an ad- initiative uh, in the States because, of course, right now there's a lot of uh, problems with that. So uh, they mm-hmm. selected a couple of my pieces uh, to show that Japan is really, really beautiful and that we should all uh, be, we are all part of the same species. and Celebrate uh, the differences. Yes, exactly. And then, yeah. uh, of course, I'm going to be at Artist Project next year if that's uh, a thing that's happening. I Fingers hope. crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <Yeah. laughs> So, uh, so that's about most of the things that I have uh, going on right now. There's not really a, a whole lot happening at the moment. <laughs> so I always like to end my interviews with uh, if money, time, pandemic was no issue, what would your big hairy ass goal be? My hairy ass goal would be to, uh, oh gosh, to travel the world with all of my artwork and and show all my artwork to all the people so all the people can know that we are all one species and we are all part of the same of the same being and we should all all feel like we are part of the same species that's an amazing way to end the interview Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed uh, enjoyed chatting with you and uh, me too. And getting to know about your me. travels. Okay. Thank well, you. we'll uh, we'll still talk today. We'll see you at the artist project. Definitely, I'll be there. <laughs> not before. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, okay. So I, I don't know if I have to remove you or if uh, I don't know. <laughs> whatever. Should I do? Think maybe just you could just cancel it. <laughs> I think it'll be good. Okay. I'll do that. <laughs> bye. Doesn't matter. Bye bye. <laughs> Um, and so you'll be able to see this interview on my uh, Instagram uh, page as well as my Facebook page. It will be on uh, youtube.com slash Kate Taylor art. So please go there and check out the previous interviews and leave a comment if you want. And uh, again, working on the podcast. So I think I'm up to about episode 20. So there's actually enough you can look at there and uh, we're going to get, get that caught up as well. Coming up, we have um, Courtney Sr., who founded Art and Found Day, which I did last year, and it was super fun, and I just am really interested to understand uh, kind of how she came across that concept and how it just kind of went viral across the globe, and uh, we had so many people that were, that were interested in doing that. Um, and then after that is Suzanne Clark, and she's actually going to talk to us from New Zealand. So on September 2nd, um, the Talking to Artists will actually be at 4 p.m. instead of 11 a.m. so that we, she doesn't have to do the, her interview at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, thank you so much for joining. Don't forget to check out the Riverdale Art Walk uh, this weekend at Jimmy Simpson Park. Have a fabulous and creative week, and we will talk to you later.